All right, so now let's uh, kind of make use of this and calculate a little bit of physics what's going on in the system. So we can, for example, using the inversion, we can calculate the probability of being in the excited state. So I take my steady state inversion, making use of rho 2, 2 plus rho 1, 1 equaling 1. I can rewrite uh, my occupation in the excited state as 1 half times 1 plus the inversion. We had calculated what the steady state inversion was and now I can basically turn this into a population of the excited state in the steady state. So this is the excited state, state steady state population of my system after kind of all these kind of initial oscillations have been damped away. And there's several interesting things that you can again see here. So again, let's take S0 to infinity and let's look at the case where I'm on resonance where the detuning is zero. So if S0 goes to infinity, uh, then we can basically neglect the one term here. This is zero anyway. So we have S0 over two divided by S0. So that means the row two two approaches one half as we said in the last kind of slide already we found out. So the steady state population approaches equal population between the ground state and the excited state. Now there's another thing we can calculate from this steady state population in the excited state. That's the rate with which photons are scattered, spontaneously scattered into free space. Remember every time we have an atom in the excited state, it can decay into the ground state through this spontaneous emission event. And this spontaneous emission event happens more or less isotropically in our system. So those, those photons, the light field that is radiated through spontaneous emission through such an atomic decay process, that's radiated into 4 pi solid angle, into kind of free space. And we can, can calculate the rate at which this happens from a single atom. And that's very simple because that's just the probability of being in the excited state and we know the rate with which we decay from the excited state that's just given by gamma. Okay, so the photon scattering rate, the spontaneous scattering rate that we have in which photons are scattered into free space, that's just given by the probability of being in the excited state multiplied by the decay rate. Okay, so this is also something interesting and we see that this gamma photon actually has a maximum value because rho 2, 2 can never become bigger than 1 half even if we drive the atom harder and harder and harder. Gamma photon, the photon scattering length rate will always be limited to gamma over 2, to maximum gamma over 2 for S0 going to infinity and delta being 0. Okay, That means we have an upper limit to which our atom can scatter photons into free space. So the amount of light per second you can see from an atom when you look from it from the side, that will be limited by this fundamental rate gamma over 2. So this will be a fundamental, fundamental limit to the photon scattering rate that we have from an individual atom in the system. Let's have a look at this, what this means. So let, let me consider, for example, an experiment where we kind of have here a vapor cell and we shine light uh, driving the atom coherently and we have the atoms in here. Right? There's a gas of atoms in, in my vapor cell and I'll actually show you an experiment in the next class where we're going to look at this and we know now that what's going to happen is that this light that propagates through our atomic medium uh, is actually going to be scattered right? uh, through these kind of excitation and spontaneous scattering events. So the atom will become excited when it interacts with our incoming light field but when it's excited, it can radiate a photon and can decay to the ground state by radiating a photon into all directions. And that's where we can see it. So if I now, me as an observer, I look here from the side, then I'm going to see this light coming now to the side. Now, if there wouldn't be any scatterer, I wouldn't be able to see that light. That light would just propagate from the left to the right. And if look, me looking from the side, I would never be able to see that light. That's actually interesting because you know you see all those science fiction movies and you see all those fighter planes in the space and they're shooting their lasers but actually in reality you would never would be able to see anything unless the laser beam actually directly it hits your eye is propagating directly into your eye you would never see any laser beam from the side because simply in vacuum there's nothing to scatter that light into your eye but i guess that would be a pretty boring science fiction movie to watch Okay, so now we know that each individual atom here scatters with this rate 
gamma times rho 2 2 that's the photon scattering rate in my system and now I can look how this photon scattering rate actually changes as I make my light more and more intense. So I'm rewriting this formula for the photon scattering rate in the following form. So it's just kind of rewriting this. And you see that now we have a Lorentzian here. This is the form of a Lorentzian, 1 divided by 1 plus x squared, as a function of the detuning of the system. And we have this parameter gamma prime here. So this is the gamma prime. And gamma prime, that's just gamma times 1 plus S0. Okay, so what's going to happen? As we scan our laser frequency, we change the detuning and we're asking how much light am I going to see here when I look from the side? What's the rate at which light is scattered into my eye when I look from the side? And this is what I've plotted here. So here's the photon scattering rate as a function of the detuning of the frequency mismatch of our coherent light field driving the atom and the resonance frequency of the atom. So here we are right on resonance, detuning zero. And you see as I increase my saturation parameter, S0 going from 1 to 10 to 100, I approach more and more this limiting value of 0.5 times gamma. Right? So remember it can never become larger than 0.5 here because the occupation of being in the excited state is limited to 0.5 when we drive the system, the two-level system, by a light field. Now when I go a little bit away of, uh, with the detuning, when I kind of go to kind of blue detune situations where the frequency of the light field is larger than the atomic resonance frequency or red detuning where the frequency of light is smaller than the atomic resonance frequency, you see that the photon, photon scattering rate actually decreases according to this Lorentzian profile. And you see this nice beautiful Lorentzian line shape here and for very weak saturation parameters, the width of this Lorentzian would be given kind of by the decay rate of our excited state gamma. But here's now what happens if you kind of increase the saturation intensity more and more and more. So if you drive the atom harder and harder and harder using a more powerful laser, shining it onto the atom because you think you're doing good, you're going to see more light now. What's happening to this resonance line that you see here is that it actually broadens. And it broadens because Remember, we can never have more than 0.5 here in the center. So once it's hit 0.5, it can never become larger than 0.5. But in the wings of the system, out here in the wings where I have a larger detuning, there I still have room to increase kind of the photon scattering rate. So this, this in effect leads to the fact that eventually this line, this resonance line that we're seeing, this Lorentzian profile, has to become broader and broader and broader as these wings come up and the center is always limited to 0.5. And this is what we call actually saturation broadening. So this phenomena of this line, this atomic resonance line becoming broader and broader is what we call saturation broadening of a transition. And if you're a spectroscopist and if you want to kind of measure kind of the precise frequency of your atom with a laser and you want to know exactly where does the resonance frequency of my light field match the atomic resonance frequency, then you want to have a narrow feature to determine precisely where is this kind of maximum here. And so you actually want to avoid the saturation broadening. It might be useful for other things, but if you kind of want to measure a very nice, very narrow line, then you should actually do this with very weak light to avoid this saturation phenomenon. All right, that's all I wanted to tell you today about the dynamical and steady state solutions of the optical block equations of our two-level atom with drive and dampening. Thanks a lot for watching. See you again next time.